Uh, please be in prayer for, for Brandon and his crew as they come up. He's got 12 people coming with him. Uh, Pastor Kuntz is coming up as well this week. We'll both be getting in tomorrow. So we'll have a big group here with us uh, tomorrow to pray for safety on the roads and um, for just clarity going forward as they start the renovation projects. Um, but today we'll be continuing a topic that we began two weeks ago. Last week on Father's Day, we looked at the father in the parable of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. But the week before that, we considered the topic of true followers. If you'll remember back in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, God's word tells us that not everyone who saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. We discussed the fact that there are a lot of people who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, whose lives give no indication that they're actually following him. And the text that we examined, we saw that Jesus gave three keys that separate fake followers from true followers. We also discussed that none of us want to be considered a, a phony or a fraudulent follower of Jesus Christ. We saw that three keys that separate genuine, authentic followers of Jesus are that true followers insist. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, the verse says, If any man will come after me. In order to be a true follower of Jesus, we must insist on following him. We have to have an adamant desire and a personal conviction to follow, to follow the Lord. Secondly, true followers resist. The verse continues, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. In order to truly follow God, we're going to have to resist some of our own personal wants and our own desires. We might have to turn down some opportunities and refuse some invitations in order to truly follow the Lord. And thirdly, true followers persist. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. In order to follow God, it requires commitment and consistency. You can't insist on following God some days, but not others. You can't resist your own personal desires and motivations sometimes. In order to truly follow God, we have to be persistent and consistent in seeking Him and placing Him first in our lives. Those are the three keys that we looked at just a couple weeks ago to lay the foundation for what Jesus says are his true followers. As we already touched on, there are a lot of people who say they're following Jesus. But he says, if you're not doing these things, you're not really following me. And today we're going to look at three more keys that Jesus speaks to us about. We're going to look at three other statements that he makes that indicate whether we are really following him or not. And as we consider these thoughts today, please try to avoid the temptation to think about how they apply to other people. Uh, um, it's easy to start thinking about people who say, who say they're saved, but that aren't insisting, resisting, and persisting in their own spiritual walk. But today, the things we're going to talk about, let's try to focus on ourselves and take personal inventory on, on how we are really doing in these areas. The Bible tells us that man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. And when it comes to the things that we're going to discuss today, it's easy to talk about these things. And have people thinking that we're actually doing them, but God knows your heart. He knows if you're actually doing these things, or if you're just pretending that you are. He knows whether or not you are a true follower. The Bible also tells us if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. And what that means is, if we take an honest, introspective look at our own heart and our own lives, admit where we're coming up short and correct those things, then God won't have to do it later. And that's truly one of the greatest blessings in the Bible, is to have the opportunity to examine our own hearts, to examine our lives and determine, am I really living the way that God wants me to live? And then to correct and try to improve those areas of my life where I'm falling short so I don't have to stand before the Lord one day and, and be judged for things that I could have corrected on my own. So as best as we can, let's try to keep our minds engaged and our thoughts focused on our own spiritual walk today because we're reminded you're not going to give an account for someone else's spiritual walk. But we're all going to stand before the Lord one day as our judge and give an account for our own spiritual walk and the way we've lived our own lives. So let's try to keep the focus where it should be and ask God to speak to us through his word today. With those thoughts in mind, if you find Matthew chapter 4 in your Bibles, <clears throat> the 
this is a passage we'll be starting from, as we consider three more standards by which to judge how genuinely we are really following the Lord. In Matthew chapter 4, we'll be, ver we'll be reading verses 18 through 22. Once you've found that text, if you would stand, please, for the reading of God's Word. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 4, verse 18, the Bible says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And straightway they left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw two other brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you today just so thankful. Amen. Lord, we're thankful for the physical ability to come here into your yes. house. Yes. Lord, we know that Amen. there are many people that we love, people that we care about, that would really like to be here today, but are unable to. Lord, we pray for those that are sick, those that are hurting, who are hindered from being here with us today. Lord, we lift them up to you in prayer and pray that you will restore their health, that you will touch their bodies, Lord. In a special way. Lord, we thank you for the sound mind that you give us so that we can come here not only yes. physically, but we can come here and we can think upon these thoughts from your word. Yes. Lord, we thank you for the brothers and sisters in Christ that we have here where we can not only think about these things for ourselves, but we can discuss them with each other. Yes. Lord, I just pray, Lord, as we sang earlier, that you will open our eyes, yes. open our ears, open our hearts today yes. to the truths that you want to us to uh, us to apply to our lives, to become more faithful, more complete and better followers of you. Amen. We pray all these things in the perfect, precious, and powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Yes. Amen. 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 Thank you for standing. You can take your seats. This is an interesting passage of Scripture. The chapter begins with Jesus alone in the wilderness. It tells us that he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and predictably, he was hungry. Then it goes on and tells how the devil tried to tempt Jesus, which is pretty much how the devil operates. He looks for any opportunity he can to take advantage of our physical situation to try to turn us away from God. Amen. Well, obviously this didn't work with Jesus, because Jesus responded to all the temptations and the challenges that the devil levied by responding with Scripture, quoting Scripture to him. And then a little bit later in the text, we pick up where we read. In verse 19, it says that Jesus walked by Peter and Andrew while they were fishing along the Sea of Galilee. And what's interesting to know about this is that Jesus gets right to the point. That there's no small talk mentioned in this verse. This wasn't just a leisurely <clears throat> stroll along the shoreline with Jesus enjoying the sunset. Jesus doesn't start talking to Peter and Andrew about the weather or start a conversation about politics or sports. Notice Jesus doesn't even introduce himself. Right. He gets right to the point. Amen. Now try to picture this scene. These two brothers basically out there just minding their own business. Just doing their job. Trying to make their living as, a, as fishermen. And Jesus walks by and the first words he ever says to them are, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And that's important. That's very significant. Because a while ago we talked about the significance of Jesus' final words before he ascended back up to heaven. When he spoke to his disciples, and he said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. The very last command that Jesus gave his disciples were to go reach people for him. And here in our text, we see that his first words to his disciples were also to reach people for him. And that's significant because most of us, if we have family members or friends that have passed on, we, not, we might not remember the details from every conversation we ever had with them, but we probably remember their final conversation and our first interactions with them. They hold special weight in our memories. They have special significance to us. And by opening and closing his interaction with the disciples with an emphasis on reaching people for him, Jesus was making it perfectly clear what he expects from his followers and what our focus should be. True followers of Jesus should have a genuine concern 
and burden for souls. We have three points that we're going to go over today, and they all begin with the letter C. The first point we see from our text is, if you're not casting, you're not following. In verse 19, Jesus says, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Jesus speaks to these men and says, follow me, and you won't just be focused on catching fish, you'll be focused on reaching people. Now, if you know anything about fishing, you know more than me. Uh, I know nothing about fishing. I've told the story before about my fishing adventure that involved a catfish, a basketball, and a pair of flip-flops. And it did not end well. So I, I don't claim to be an expert on fishing. In fact, I think we can pretty much divide people into two groups. People who go fishing and people who order fish fry because if they actually had to catch fish to survive, they would die of hunger. And I'll let you guess which group I would be in. Um, so I don't know much about fishing, but I do know one thing. If you expect to catch any fish, you have to first cast out your line. Yes, amen. Now notice Jesus doesn't say, follow me and I'll make you catchers of men. He doesn't say, if you follow me, you're going to be the most so successful soul winner in the world. He doesn't say, if you're following me, you're going to lead someone to the Lord every single day of your life. Mm. He doesn't say, if you're following me, you're going to become a world-renowned expert in evangelism. Mm. But he does say, if you're following me, if you're really following me, you'll be attempting to win souls to the Lord. Fishermen don't necessarily catch fish every time they go out. That's right. But they do attempt to catch fish. They try to catch fish. They make an effort of catching fish. And as a true follower of Jesus, you might not lead someone to Christ every single day, but Jesus makes it very clear if you're truly following him, you will be making an attempt to win souls for him. Very directly, Jesus makes it very clear in this verse, if you're not fishing, you're not following. I want you to think for a minute. When was the last time you led someone to the Lord? Let me ask you another question. When was the last time you even tried to lead somebody to the Lord? Because we see from this passage, if you're not actively focused on and attempting to lead people to salvation, Jesus Christ, you're not truly following. If you look at verse 19 with me, notice Jesus doesn't say, Follow me, and I'll make you an attender of church. Yeah, that's right. He doesn't say, follow me, and I'll make you a reader of the Bible. Because the cold truth is, there are a lot of Christians who go to church. There are a lot of people who read the Bible. But Jesus says, if you follow me, if you truly follow me, you will be a fisher of men. You'll have a burden, you'll have a focus on reaching the lost, reaching people in a genuine interest in the souls of others. And if you're not attempting to reach other people for the Lord, Jesus says very clearly in verse 19, you're not a true follower. In Luke chapter 15, verse 7, it says that there is joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, right. more than over 99 just persons which need no repentance. Have you ever thought about that? That God is more pleased when one single person gets saved? When one single person that he died and bled and suffered on Calvary for? He's more pleased when one single person gets saved than anything else that we do as saved. Sometimes as Christians, we can get confused over what really matters to God. We think, if I'm coming to church, I'm doing good. If I'm reading my Bible and praying, I'm doing really good. If I'm giving or serving, then God must be really blown away by how good I am in my spiritual walk right now. And, and don't get me wrong, those are all good things. It's good to go to church. It's good to pray and read your Bible. It's good to give tithes and offerings to the Lord and use your talents to serve Him. But First Samuel... Chapter 15, verse 22 says, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Yes. Amen. And to hearken than the fat of rams. Yes. God says those sacrifices that you give, there's more to it than that. And what I really desire from true followers is obedience. And here we see in, that in his final command before he left the earth, and here in his first interaction with his disciples, Jesus makes it very clear what is most important, and that is reaching people for him. Right. And we see here that if you're not fishing... You're not following. If you're not attempting to lead people to the Lord, you're not really, truly following him. If you're not making effort to share the gospel with others and lead them to Christ, you're not a true follower of his. So the first point we see today is if you're not casting, you're not following. And next we see if you're too comfortable, you're not really following. You go turn over a few, a few pages 
to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8, in verses 19 and 20 we read, And a certain, a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus saith unto him, the foxes, have, the foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Yeah. Yeah. Once again we see a person here who makes an oath to follow the Lord. And that's a great thing. I, I hope you've made your, that decision for yourself to follow the Lord and to seek His will for your life. And this idea of following the Lord, that's a noble aspiration. It's a worthy pledge to make. But sometimes I think we minimize what it actually means to follow the Lord no matter the cost. We think of following the Lord and seeking Him first, and even in Christian circles, it, it almost becomes kind of glamorized and romanticized. Now we sing that song, Follow, follow, I will follow Jesus. Anywhere, everywhere, I will follow on. Follow, follow, I will follow Jesus. Everywhere he leads me, I will follow on. And that sounds great, and we're motivated by those words. And that's essentially what this man here says to Jesus. He says, Master, I'll follow you wherever you go. No matter what happens, I'm going to stay here with you. I'm going to follow you. Then once again, Jesus gets right to the point. Amen. He doesn't say, oh, I'm just so glad you're coming. <clears throat> you're going to love it. You're going to have so much fun on this little spiritual journey together. You're going to have this spiritual journey and just find out so much about yourself. The scribe says, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. But notice, Jesus doesn't stop him from coming. He doesn't say, no, don't follow me, go back home. But he doesn't sugarcoat it either. Right. He says, you know, those, those foxes that we saw earlier, those birds you hear singing in the trees, if you're going to truly follow me, they're going to have it easier than me. Mm. Jesus says, the foxes have holes to go to, the birds have nests, but... I don't even have a place to call my own. Now, I don't want to go off on this topic too far, but just think about that statement. Jesus Christ, God in human form, the one who created the entire world, the one who created those very foxes and birds, yeah. created places. They had places to lay their heads when they were here on earth, but the creator of it all had nowhere to lay his head. Yeah. He says, I don't even have a home. I don't have a place to lay my head. That's what we're saying here. Look, if you're going to follow me, if you're going to be a true follower, it's not going to be comfortable. If you're going to truly follow the Lord, you're not going to be comfortable all the time. Jesus says, look, I don't even have a place to lay my head. I'm not living in the lap of luxury. I don't have the comforts that other people or even other animals are experiencing right now. If you're going to follow me, you're not going to have those comforts either. Now, this doesn't mean if you have a pillow and a bed to go home at night that you're somehow out of the will of God. That's not what I'm saying. But it does mean that if you are going to truly follow God, you're going to have to do that at the expense of other comforts. Yes. Amen. And the thing is, a lot of Christians will follow God when it's comfortable. When it doesn't really cost them anything. When it doesn't require much faith. A lot of people are really quick to get on board. <coughs> but if you're only serving the Lord in your comfort zone, you're not really, truly following God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 says that we walk by faith, not by sight. The thing is, there's a lot of Christians that walk only by sight. <coughs> if they can't see the way God's leading, if they can't understand what God's doing, then they don't follow him. Hmm. Romans chapter 8, verse 24 says, basically, if you have to know the outcome before you get started, that's not really faith. Hmm. Now, if you're serving the Lord in some area and he's giving you a gift or a talent, and you're using it for him in that area, that's great. But if you're not following the Lord the way you should be because it's outside of your comfort zone, you're not truly following God. If you're not serving in some ministry that God might be speaking to you about, because it's challenging, or it takes you out of your comfort zone, you're not truly following God. And the thing about this is that sometimes we confuse serenity with spirituality. If everything is harmonious and peaceful, I must be holy. Hmm. We think, well, if I'm at ease, I must be on the right track. When really, Jesus says here, the opposite is true. Right. Luke chapter 6, verse 26 says, Beware when all men speak well of you. That's right. Watch out when everything seems peaceful and tranquil in your spiritual life. Just because you've been doing the same thing for the past 20 years doesn't mean that God's actually pleased with it. Doesn't mean you're actually growing or truly following it. You know, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for going through the motions spiritually. <coughs> if, 
you're going through the motion spiritually just out of habit, it doesn't make it religious. It just makes it routine. Right. And we like routines because they provide a level of comfort. They, we feel more in control because we know what to expect. But if we place too much effort, emphasis on our own comfort, we're not truly following God. There are some of the people, we touched on this a couple Sunday nights ago, but some of the people who deal with uncomfortable things are soldiers. They have to carry that heavy equipment. They're constantly in dangerous areas, battling the elements of extreme heat or extreme cold, and doing all of this while being engaged in warfare with their enemies. And spiritually, spiritually speaking, God compares Christians to soldiers. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, it says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. One thing that sets us apart as true followers is the willingness to endure hardness. To be willing to subject ourselves to hard things. Now, what would you think about a soldier who hid from all the action until the fighting was done? You'd say, well, he's not a true soldier. But if you're not engaged in activities that challenge you to grow spiritually outside of your comfort zone, you're not truly following God. In Ephesians chapter 6, the Bible once again uses uh, imagery related to soldiers, but it says, it tells us to put on the full armor of God. And why does it tell us that we need to do that? So that we can stand against the wiles of the devil. And if you think to yourself, well, I don't think I need that. Now that, that breastplate of righteousness, that shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the, the sword of the spirit, I don't really need, seem to need the armor of God. If that's the case, it might be, so, be because you're so far away from the action, the devil isn't bothering you. But make no mistake about it, if you're truly following God, if you're a true follower of the Lord, the devil is going to try to engage you and do everything he can to disrupt your spiritual walk. But if you're never in any need of the armor of God, it might be because you're not really following God closely enough to be any threat to the devil. But if you're truly following God, you can't be too focused on being comfortable. In Luke chapter 2, verse 7, it says that when Jesus was born... They wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for him, for him in the end. And in the text we just read in Matthew chapter 8, verse 20, the foxes have holes, the birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. From the day he was born yes. no. until the day we find him here as an adult, <coughs> Jesus could never depend on any comfort, <coughs> any ease, or any luxury. And if we're truly following him, we won't be overly concerned with our own level of comfort. We see here from our text, if you're not casting, you're not following. If you're too focused on comfort, you're not really following. And our last point is, is found in James chapter 1, verse 22. I won't ask you to turn there because many of you will have this verse memorized. But my final point is, if you're complacent, you're not truly following God. James chapter 1, verse 22 says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers yeah. only, deceiving your own selves. I'm going to try to... Um, take my words very carefully because I'm not trying to uh, offend anyone but I also want to make it very clear biblically how big of an issue this is. I, I just want you to think for a minute. Statistically there are approximately 63, 63 million people in America attending church on Sunday morning today. Of the 63 million people who have heard God's word today how many do you think will actually do anything with what they've heard? Yeah. Even here in our own church today, many have heard the word. They've followed along. They've read along with these verses in the Bible. But how many will actually do anything about it? And now here's what really matters. What are you doing with what you hear from God's word? Yeah. Are you applying God's word to your own life? Are you putting God's word into action? Or are you just hearing it and not changing anything? If that's the case, if you're content to hear God's word and not actually do anything with God's word, you're not truly following God. And please understand, I'm not trying to emphasize what I've said today to make this, uh, like, this is what's important, but how about your Bible reading this week? When you read God's word this week, what did you change? What changed in, in, in result of your direct communication with God this week? Because if you came face-to-face -face with God 
God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit through his text, and you were able to leave that, that interaction and go about your daily business without changing anything, you're not really following God. You're going through the motions. None. What did you pray about this week? How did that affect your life? Because if you prayed morning and night and nothing ever changed, you're not truly following God. You're going through the motions. Are you a doer or just a hearer when you hear from God? Because if you're only a hearer, you're not a true follower of Jesus Christ. Remember Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. If you want to turn back, it's just one page over. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of God, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. And the problem is, there are 63 million people in churches all across America this morning. There are people reading their Bibles every single day. There are Christians hearing God on a daily basis, but not actually doing anything of what the Bible says. There are Christians who know Scripture in their heads, but it doesn't affect their heart. It doesn't affect their lives. There are Christians who've been coming to church for years, reading the Bible for, for years, and still have the same problems, same issues that they had 20 years ago. People who know what the Bible says about anger, but doesn't do what, doesn't do what God says. People who, who know what God's word says about controlling their tongue, but don't do it. Parents who know that God's word says not to provoke their children to anger, but to raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, but don't do it. As we look at today, there are people who know God's word says to be fishers of men, but haven't attempted to lead anybody to Christ in years, maybe even ever. And the problem is, there are a lot of people who think they're okay. Think they're fine spiritually. Coming to church, hearing God's word, reading the Bible. But James says, you're not okay. You're not fine. You're not really following God. And the, the, the end of James chapter 1, verse 22, it says, there are a lot of people who have deceived themselves and are simply thinking that hearing God's word is enough. But if you're only hearing God's word, and not actually doing anything with it, if it doesn't affect your life and challenge you or convict you and change you, you're mistaken. You've, you've deceived yourself. Jesus, once again, says, not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Not everybody who calls him Lord is really living for him. And not even everybody that's coming to church in the morning on Sundays are truly following him in their day-to-day -day lives. He says, you know, there's a lot of people claiming to please me, but I'm not pleased with them. But he that doeth the will of my Father, those are the true followers, the ones who are really following him. <clears throat> Today we look at three indicators to gauge ourselves of whether we're really following God or if we're just deceiving ourselves, going through the motions. If that's the case, you're not a true follower. And it is, you can fool other people. You can even deceive yourself. None. But you're not fooling God. That's right. He knows who is truly following him. So I've got to understand your brother Bud come forward. If you're preparing out for a time of invitation, we can have every head bowed and every eye closed.
year and maybe you've gotten too comfortable in your spiritual routine. Maybe you used to serve God in some way, but just kind of stopped because it was just easier. Or if there's something on your heart that you've been avoiding because it feels difficult or out of your comfort zone. I bet your prayer today to for God to change that so you can truly follow him more closely. That's your prayer today. If you raise your hands, we'll pray for you about that. And yes, you see those hands? And yes, you can take them down if you raise them. If, you, if your prayer today is, you know, maybe you'd say, I've been in church a lot. You know, maybe even most of your life. I've heard preaching, I've heard teaching, I've read the Bible myself, but if I were to be honest, most of my spiritual walk consists of hearing and not actually doing. If you haven't been seeing the results of spiritual fruit and growth you would expect from exposure to God's Word, it's not because His Word isn't powerful anymore. It's because you've gotten complacent and content to just hear God's Word and not act on it. If your prayer today is to not just be a hearer, to be a more consistent doer of what you know, what God's already instructed you to do through his word. If that's your prayer today, if you raise your hands, we can pray for you about that. Amen. Yes, we see those hands. Yes, we take them down if you raise them. Thank you. In just a moment, we're going to have a time of invitation. But first, if you would plant, if you'd stand, please, for a word of prayer, as we prepare for the invitation. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your, your love. Good. Lord, we thank you that we serve a God that we don't have to wonder what you expect. Good. We don't have to try to decipher and try to figure out if we are pleasing in your sight. Lord, we thank you for your words that are so direct that show us very clearly, Lord, if we're not attempting to win souls for Christ, Lord, that we're not trying to influence other people for you and bring them to maybe saving knowledge in Jesus Christ, and we're not really following you. We thank you for revealing to us, Lord, that it's easy to, in our world to look for the easy way and try to get comfortable and complacent. Lord, help us to be reminded today, Lord, we're thankful, we're thankful for the reminder today that just because we're more comfortable or more, things are more easy for us doesn't mean that we're actually pleasing you. It doesn't mean we're following you. Lord, I pray for those that raise their hands to uh, indicate it, that uh, um, they haven't been <clears throat> sharing the gospel the way they, they should. They haven't been making the attempt to lead other people to Christ. They haven't been acting upon the things in your word, Lord. Those have become kind of complacent in hearing your word, but not acting upon it, not doing it. Lord, I pray that you will help us all to be convicted, Father, not just today. Lord, it's easy for these things to be fresh in our minds when we look at these verses, Lord. But I pray for the Holy Spirit to convict us and move in our hearts on a consistent basis so we can truly follow you more consistently and more perfectly each and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.